Here to explore the future of free speech and free expression, please welcome author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And leading the conversation is the Atlantic senior editor, Gal Beckham. <laughs> well, it's great to uh, it's great to be here today with you, Chimamanda. You go on. Um, you too. So we know that you're the author of three novels, including Americana, which is now basically part of the canon, <laughs> I think I can say. Uh, but in recent years, you've also become a pretty fierce uh, defender of the freedom of expression, um, especially in a moment uh, that feels particularly censorious in the United States, where there's been an uptick in book banning, there's publishers that feel sort of more reluctant to publish certain kinds of books. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. <laughs> um, we'll also talk about uh, Mama's uh, sleeping scarf. I'll ask you some very hard-hitting questions <laughs> eventually, um, but uh, but we'll get to that in, in a bit. Um, so recently, I rewatched your 2009 TED Talk, the one that went viral, "The Danger of a Single Story," in which you describe the way that uh, that people can sort of limit one another by placing very constricting narratives about who they are. The story you told about coming to the United States as a Nigerian, people had very fixed ideas about what it meant to be from Africa. And, um, so I, I wanted to ask you about sort of the state of the single story right now, and with a slight twist, which is this, which is when I watched that you know, TED talk, it seemed to me you were talking about how other people impose a single story on one another. But I also see that we're in a moment where people are imposing single stories on themselves, you know, whether it be race or gender or political affiliation. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, about all, of, all of that. Wow. That was long. I don't start. I don't start <laughs> with the easy ones. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for um, the welcome. It was for both of us, girl, not just. Oh, okay. Me. Okay. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> yes. <okay>. Um, <laughs> no, I think you know it's interesting what you said about the single story not no longer being just about an outside imposition, but also almost in some ways a self imposition, mm -hmm. and. You know, the idea that I'm seen as a fierce defender of, of, of the freedom to express oneself is not really, I don't want to be that, right. but it feels important to talk about because mm -hmm. I, think, I think there's a problem with the way that we're living now, which is, um, so the w one thing is I think we now kind of live in these tribes. Mm. So the, the sort of ideological tribes and these ideological tribes, I think, have imposed on us a kind of um, the, a kind of what we're supposed to an adherence to orthodoxy. Mm. Right. So this um, Ayad Akhtar, who's a writer I really admire, he he calls it. He says that there's a moral stridency mm. in the way that we respond to speech, mm. and that there's something punitive about it. And I think it's true. I think. People are afraid. Hmm. And because people are afraid, people self-censor. They don't say. So the, the single story, they then impose it on themselves. Um, I think it happens with publishing. I think it happens in politics. You have people who now increasingly think that you cannot write about experiences that you have not personally had. Hmm. And I think that's terrible for literature and for the idea of an imagination that is allowed to grow and soar. And mm. you know, I don't think that there's any human um, endeavor that requires freedom as much as creativity does. Mm. I mean, how can we write novels if in our heads we've imposed a single story for ourselves, if we self-censor, if we're thinking, I can't go there, I can't go there, I can't be honest, I can't really say what I think. Right. You know. Um, and so I just worry, I worry that, that um, that, that what we're looking at is the end of curiosity, mm -hmm. the end of creativity, the end of learning even, right? I'm sure if I asked people in this audience um, if there, there's anyone here who has questions they want to ask about certain things, but they don't because they're afraid mm -hmm. of either being misunderstood or asking it the wrong way or getting some kind of, you know, um, 
pushback or, or I think if people were honest, I think there would be quite a few of them here. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes even saying that I'm afraid to ask in itself right. comes with po the possibility of backlash, so we don't right. say. Now, do you, when you gave that TED talk in mm. 2009, which was now a while ago, did you have that aspect of the single story in mind? Or was it more that you felt that the, the certain ways that society was sort of conceiving mm. of you were limiting? No, I didn't. I didn't. I mean, and I think at the time, I don't think that what I imagined to be this sort of broad social phenomenon, it wasn't really happening then. Mm. Right. I think America has always, of course, had these ideological extremes, but I don't think it, it at the time it, it was as present mm -hmm. as it is now. What prompted that really was two things, coming to the US to go to college and just being shocked by how little people knew of my world. I mean, mm. I just thought that it was very strange that in um, 1997, people would ask me, do you have houses in Nigeria? <laughs> right? And I just, I was, I was stunned by that, you know. And in some ways, when you're outside of the US and America has such cultural power right, that right. we're all familiar in some ways with right. America. So we watch the films, we listen to the music. And in some ways, you stupidly assume that mm. America also has a sense of you. Right. And then I came here and I just was shocked by that. Yeah. But it also made me think about how, in some ways, we're all, as human beings, um, potentially guilty of having mm -hmm. a single story about other people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so while I was upset that they knew very little about where I had come from, um, I went to Mexico and I realized, my goodness, I'm doing the same thing right. that Americans right. did to me. Because in Mexico, I thought, right. my God, they're normal, they're happy, they're laughing. <laughs> because I had been in this country where the constant coverage of Mexicans right. was so negative and so one-sided right. right. that I go to Mexico and I'm shocked. Right. And so I just felt I wanted to talk about that, that, that very human, I think, mm -hmm. um, human thing that we all have, mm -hmm. but also how important it is maybe to be a bit more self-aware. Mm. But I did not at all foresee <laughs> what's happening now. Right. This right. kind of just, just what I think is just a really horrible um, social censure that's mm. connected to the ability to speak and express right. oneself. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you recently wrote an essay about on the 10 year anniversary of the publication of Americana mm. and uh, we published it in the, in the Atlantic as well. And you had a lot of interesting things in there about sort of what the genesis was of the book, yeah. including what you're talking about right now. Yeah. There was one line and one particular word that stood out to me that I just wanted to read you. Uh, you said, of all of the complicated emotions that animated the conception of this novel, bewilderment was the most <laughs> present. And so I wanted to, to ask you, what, what bewilders you? And I think you were referring to sort of your sense of bewilderment at the thing that you just described, which yes. is the, the limited understanding of yes. your place in the world. Yes. Um, what bewilders you today about America? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know that we have enough time, though, but I'm going to try. <laughs> I thought you might say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, first of all, politically, I, I genuinely do not understand, and I think it's a worthy question to ask, the appeal of Donald Trump. Um, I, I just do not understand it. And I think, you know, the, we're talking about, oh, who's going to win um, the elections in this country? And, and it seems to me that there is a kind of almost willful um, disregard of the fact that there's a person who I think is dangerous for this country, who has enormous support in certain parts of this country. And we should ask, I think we should ask why. why? I want to understand it and I don't. So that bewilders me. Um, I think also this idea of, you know, the, the tribal um, orthodoxies, you know, that there's certain things you're not supposed to say. I think in this country now, if somebody on the right agrees with something, there are many people on the left who feel compelled to immediately disagree with right, it right. and not think about the content of it. Right, right. So this kind of tribal thinking, mm -hmm. um, which I think shuts down thought. Mm. You know, we're not thinking critically. Mm -hmm. So someone on the right approves of this, I don't approve of it because I'm on the left. And I think also the reverse is the case. Yeah. And I find that bewildering on so many levels because we, what it means is that we can't even talk about you know, I want to talk about the content of things. I want to be able to, um, you know, decide for myself whether something is good or bad and, and not have it be linked to whether my tribe right. approves of it. Right. 
And I think it's getting worse and worse. And so, which is the reason why I'm increasingly bored with political discourse in this country, mm. because I can see someone on TV or read a piece in a newspaper, and I kind of know what their position is mm -hmm. on anything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and often it's very tribally correct, yeah. which may not necessarily be <laughs> intellectually correct. Right. <laughs> you know? right. right. So that bewilders me. Um, but this is also a country, you know, this is, America is my second home. I, and there's a kind of, you know, in the way that you worry when you see something you care about starting to crumble. Mm. That's the feeling I have about mm. the US mm. right now. Social media, which I know, oh, <laughs> I'm just gonna th <laughs> throw the happy subjects at you. Um, I know that this sort of provokes some sadness in you. I mean, we talked about it a little bit uh, backstage um, because of the way that it's created yeah. a kind of conformity or, yeah. you know, f especially with young people sort of not able to break out of certain yeah. orthodoxies. I wanted to read sort of a long, a longish thing that you said in, tw in tw you wrote in 2021, in which you did not mince words about <laughs> how you felt. You said, we have a generation of young people on social media so terrified of having the wrong opinions that they have robbed themselves of the opportunity to think and to learn and to grow. I've spoken to young people who tell me they are terrified to tweet anything, to, to your point just now, that they read and reread their tweets because they fear they will be attacked by their own. The assumption of good faith is dead. What matters is not goodness, but the appearance of goodness. We are no longer human beings. We are now angels jostling to out-angel one another. God help us, it is obscene. Um, so I guess I'm curious to hear specifically about the effect that you think this might have on creativity. Yeah. And you, you do work with, with younger writers. I know yeah. that you have this wonderful workshop uh, in Nigeria that you said hasn't happened since 2019, but you have this experience yeah. of working with, with younger writers. Um, what, what do you see as sort of the greater impact on creativity from the dynamic that you're describing here? Oh, goodness. Well, first of all, realistically, I thought, ah, oh, that's not bad. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what <laughs> that's you're That's a good thought, feeling. Oh, that's kind of okay. <laughs> I've forgotten that I wrote that. Yeah. But, you know, I think, well, first of all, I think that there is, it seems to me that there is a decline today, a massive decline in compassion. Mm and also a decline in moral courage. Mm -hmm. And I think that in some ways both are connected, mm. um, which is, you know, the young people, and not just young people, really, everyone, people who are in, on social media, there's an expectation that you will not get compassion. And so, you know, you, you tweet something and then people are coming at you, even your friends who know that you, who, and, and that, that idea that whatever you say has the most uncharitable, mm -hmm. um, that people will read it in the most uncharitable way. Mm. I think it makes people hold back. Mm. And then of course the moral courage part of it is that there are people who could speak up and they don't. Yeah. I think what's happening now in the sort of, you know, the books that are not being published, the, you know, you open the newspapers and often there's someone who's been dropped from something. It's often not because those in positions of authority really believe that what has been said was bad, it's because mm. they're afraid. Mm. They're afraid of themselves being attacked. And that's what I mean by moral courage, that mix of compassion and moral courage. Yeah. And what it does for people who, who are creative is it makes you, um, it makes you turn in wards. Yeah. You know, you're no longer willing to, I think creativity also requires a kind of risk taking. Mm. You know, you have to be able to, um, to go outside of what is comfortable for you. I think that's where great art comes from. Right. And so with this, kind of, with this kind of social censure hanging over people, it's so much more difficult, I think, right. Right. to create, to write. Right. And, and I see that, you know, I haven't done the workshop in, um, since COVID, and I'm doing it this year, but you can see that even in the, in the small space of a workshop, I constantly have to say to people, it's okay. Right? You, can actually, if you can actually write that, you know, it's okay. Because you can see that they're already worried about what the people in the workshop are going to think. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a, there's a, I remember this young man who wrote a story about a man who, um, is objecti who sees a young woman and he just completely objectifies her. So he writes the story and he reads a bit of it and then the other people in the workshop just come for him. Mm. They're like, oh my God, you're sexist, you're misogynist. 
And then this poor guy says, no, I don't agree with the character. I don't agree with the character. And you know, it just made me think we can't even read anymore. Yeah. I mean, this idea that we immediately, the assumption is somehow that he is condoning mm -hmm. what the character does. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a problem, right? right. It's, and it's the same way that we, um, Again, I think it's, it's a lack of compassion, but also in some ways that we can't even read anymore. I mean, that, right. that I, I don't know, I wish people would read more and particularly right. read more imaginative writing. Right. I think it right. would make, right. maybe it would make us a bit more right. compassionate. No, I wanted to ask you, because this critique that I know that you have, you know, of what we're describing here, this sort of like adherence to a kind of orthodoxy, a, scare, a fear of sort of stepping out of line, it's something that we see a lot on the progressive left. Yeah. Yeah. And how does it, and since you have sort of made this point a few times mm -hmm. publicly, um, how does it feel to be the one who kind of is at risk of looking like a scold to your own <laughs> to your own side, so to speak? <laughs> oh, that doesn't bother me. Doesn't bother. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it, it's. I wish I didn't have to. I mean, I really want to just stay home and and read poetry yeah. and try and write fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's really what I want to do. Yeah. But, but I've always been that, you know, even as a child, I was sort of the one who felt compelled to speak out about things I thought were unjust, you know, that kind of nonsense, because right. I, I want to save the world, all of that. But, but again, it's coming from a place of, of love, right? I'm, so in terms of tribes, I am on the left. You know, right. I, I, think that, I think that the political left makes more sense and mm -hmm. is more humane in general. But I also think that there's so many problems now with the left. So we can talk about the right and the kind of crazy book banning, the book yeah. banning well, that are ask happening. I was going to because your own book was, was apparently was banned. Uh, yeah, and I don't know why. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I thought I mean, such a ghost company, though. I mean, look at all the wonderful books that yeah. have been banned. <laughs> but but that that's just really bad because you're you're depriving children mm -hmm. of of knowledge and of, of pleasure, yeah. because books bring yeah. pleasure. And you know, on the right as well, all of this talk about, which I find just personally abhorrent, this decision to hide the mm -hmm. truth of history. Mm -hmm. And so in the name of stupid ideas like CRT, they're not allowing children know the history of America. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that African American history is essential. It is American history. And the truth has to be told. And somehow this idea that you want to protect children mm -hmm. from not feeling bad, yeah about the truth is absurd, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I, was also, I was also thinking about, you know, often on the right you hear when they want to uh, make fun of people on the left, they say, well, facts don't care about your feelings. Yeah. Actually, we should be saying that to people on the right who want to, who want to um, hide the truth of African-American history. Right. You know? And, and I came, obviously, from, from Nigeria to go to college, and I didn't really know very much about African-American history. And I, mm -hmm. and I, because I was curious and I wanted to understand, started reading African-American mm -hmm. history. Um, I feel that I'm a bit of an expert now, self-styled. Mm -hmm. self but, but for me, really, it was a story of such wonderful grace and grit, right. not just about, you know, the horrors. And I think young Americans should know that. You know, mm -hmm. they should know that. They deserve to. But on the left... It bothers me that my own tribe, um, you know, it's easy for us to criticize people who are banning books, but what are we saying to ourselves about the self-censorship that we are promoting right. and about the way that we attack our own so viciously, mm -hmm. right? We, we, there's a sense in which on the left, it's so easy to fall short of expectations, it's so easy. You know, there's a kind of, I mean, what I said about out-angeling um, one another, we're now supposed to be perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that kind of puritanism. You're, you're not even supposed to, you're supposed to know everything, right? Um, you're supposed to know the right language to use. You're mm -hmm. supposed to know, and you're not, you're not expected to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And if you do ask, I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you this about when I was in, um, I was speaking to some students and I won't tell you where, but you know, we're talking about things and suddenly I stop and I ask them, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, these, there's, there's this ascendancy of buzzwords. We throw things around. And so I said to them, explain it to me as if I were in kindergarten. Mm. And they couldn't. Mm. There's a kind of, so we, we, we throw these things out and we expect everyone to know them. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think on the left, and again, of course I care more about the left because it's, you know, it's kind of where I feel more comfortable. And it's not that I'm being a scold. I'm hoping that what I'm doing is saying what a lot of people on the left are thinking. I see. Yeah? I see. 
But also, I hope that what I'm doing is, is that maybe I'm able to get a few people to stop and say, wait, hold on. Mm -hmm. But I think if more of us decided that we were going to, for example, um, be less vicious, mm. a bit more compassionate, mm. you know, just give people a bit more room. Right. Um, maybe, maybe be more charitable. When somebody says something, don't immediately... So don't immediately interpret it to mean the worst possible thing. Mm -hmm. if, we, if more of us did that, maybe the tone on social media would change a bit. Maybe the literature will, we produce would be a bit more, um, would be a bit less narrow. You know, I don't really find contemporary fiction very interesting yeah, I was going to ask you about that. We, 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 well, we can, like, let's, let's take yeah. that up. So you were telling me backstage that you don't, you don't read much or you don't, I, I imagine yeah. you still read stuff, I read, I mean, I try to, I really try to keep, so, you know, I'm, I'm constantly buying books and I do try to, and I, I do that because I'm thinking about when I started and how terrified I was that nobody would buy my books. Yeah. So I'm always going to buy, especially first novels, you know, I just go, and I buy them and I, and I almost never finish them. But is there a consist, is, <laughs> no, it's true. Is there, is there, is there some sort of consistent thing that you're saying, oh, here we go again, you know, like, or, or, yes. or something that there, you're bumping up against as a reader? I remember recently reading this book and I thought, my God, everybody is good mm. in this book. And that's a lie. I mean, you, you, you know, but no, but it's true. The thing about being human, and this is what literature should do for us. It should show us all sides of ourselves. Right, right. And I read this book and everyone was good and everyone was ideologically correct. Mm. Everyone had all the right opinions. Right. And I thought I that think is... we call that propaganda. No? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not literature. You know, it's it's and, and and you can see that the people are not real people. I mean, I, I love this expression, um, um, H. G. Wells, that that literature should be about the jolly coarseness of life. Mm. And to that, I like to say it doesn't have to be jolly. Just right. the coarseness of right. life will do. Right. And I find that in a lot of these um, contemporary books, even when they dare to approach something that might be even remotely controversial. Mm. It's very, um, it's it's very half-hearted. It's just it doesn't feel real, and you can tell that the writer is so aware of the possibility of backlash. Right. I mean, we live in a world now where people talk about sensitivity readers. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you were a writer, you don't want your publisher to have to get a sensitivity reader for your book. Right. So you're going to do the sensitivity right. writing yourself. Yourself. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the other sort of, to me, victims of some of this sens censoring sort of attitude is humor, you know, mm. because um, just mm. the ability to, and, and you know, the humor you need to mm. in order to, you want to be able to roam imaginatively yes. into other people's minds and, yes. and, uh, and that makes for good writing. And yes. uh, as I was thinking about talking to you today, I remembered one of my sort of highlights of when I was an editor at the New York Times Book Review was uh, in 2016, you wrote a short story for us uh, in, which, <laughs> in which you entered the mind of Melania Trump and, 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 and wrote a story from her perspective. So I first, had to rem I first had to make sure this wasn't like a fever dream that I had. So I, I went, but I went back and I read, I read the story, which was quite charming and good. I should say this was before the election. Yes. So that's an important piece of context here. But I could also tell how much fun you were having sort of trying to get into her head, and it was funny. And, and um, so I don't know. I, oh, I'm, good I'm Lord. Curious. I'm, I'm, I'm curious you're really bringing up things that I would rather put away. No, that's, that's, no, tell me what you're curious about, though. No, I was, yeah. I was curious about sort of the, because that seemed very much coming from a place of, of humor, of wanting to sort of play around <laughs> with an idea. And, and it was humor that had the effect of some empathy. Yes. You, were, you, you actually sort of tried to get into her head, tried to really understand her. I did. Her. And I did a lot of research. I mean, I went and I read about this woman, about her family, uh -huh. and you know, I, I read about you know, the little town where she came from. And, and I, I have to say that at the time, I felt much sympathy for her because mm. I thought, this is not what she signed up for, right. is what I was thinking. I do have to say, to be very honest, because I, I, you know, I believe in being truthful, that my views about her, my sympathy has has, um, you know, sort of decreased substantially. <laughs> um, and that decrease started when I learned about her, her um, belief in this ridiculous idea of, of Obama not being born in America. Mm. And um, that just really annoyed me, because yeah. I thought, really, you? I mean, seriously? 
Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, that, that empathy decreased, I'm sorry to say. But okay. I did try, you know, to, to make her human and, and also, yes, to laugh about it. But, but also I think that humor as a, as a, as a device in storytelling mm -hmm. is so important because, right. because we can use humor to talk about things that really matter. Mm -hmm. And humor is universal. And so when people are laughing, but they're also sort of taking something in. Mm -hmm. And here's the other thing about the, pro the progressive left, um, my tribe. We've lost the ability to laugh. Well, that's, that's what it seems to me yeah. is, is we really one have. of the biggest uh, yeah. victims of all yeah. of this. Yeah. And yeah. it's a shame. Yeah. I mean, there's sort of now this, you know, we all sort of wake up in the morning and we put on our cloaks of sanctimony and we go off to, you know, <laughs> well, judge you may, everyone you may, else. You may not yeah. have, have felt you know, somebody might not have felt able to write inside Melania Trump's head for fear of looking like they were yes. sympathizing with, with her. Yes, right? yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the role of a storyteller is to imagine what a human being is thinking and feeling. Right. You know, we, we, and I think storytellers are essential for, for every society. If we don't have our story, storytellers feeling free enough to tell mm -hmm. our stories, we're losing something, and then the generations who will come after us, I right. think they're going to just be startled. Right. You know, we look back and we read, we read Dickens, and we, you know, I read Balzac, and I'm, I'm, I get a sense of what life was like then. I worry that, I wonder if people reading contemporary writing mm. today will get a true sense of what our lives are like. Right, right. And so I'm going to, no, I, and I'll tell you this without naming names, but um, should I? I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I wrote this children's book, yeah. my first children's book, and I was, um, I was going to do, I had been you know, asked to do an interview with a very respected uh, media outfit in America. And um, a few days before the interview, my, um, my publisher tells me, oh, I'm so sorry, they just said you can't, they cannot go forward with the interview. Mm. And I said, oh. Why? And they said, well, because they think that they cannot interview you if you're not willing to address the comments you made in 2017 about trans women. Trans women yeah. And I was so stunned by that. Mm. I thought, well, I wrote a children's book. Yeah. And I think what stunned me even more was the willingness of this media organization to be open about the reason that they were canceling the interview. Right. I mean, usually people, if people felt that there was something maybe not so... Um, admirable about their reasons, they would kind of hide them, right? Mm -hmm. They might say, oh, the producer is unwell. Mm -hmm. But they said that, and it made me think, I mean, I, you know, I was stunned, and I have to say I was kind of hurt. Mm -hmm. But also it made me start to understand how certain people can um, choose not to speak out. And by this, I mean, in the past, I would sometimes say, look, you know, there's some people who are so successful. You know, can you just say these things publicly? There are people who would write to me and say, you know, I really agree, there's so much censorship, but they will not say it publicly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would think a little bit judgmentally, I'd be like, well, you're very successful, why don't you say it publicly? But when this happened, my first thought was, oh, this book that I love mm. will not get to find readers. Right. And so it made me start to understand that human impulse, it's not that we, it's not even about wanting money, or it's, it's that you've created something that you really want the wall to see. Right. And the possibility that you might be denied that makes you hold back. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so to to and since I've already so in I gave I did an interview in 2017 in which I was asked, and it was in London, um, and I said, I think a trans woman is a trans woman. And I think that because I think it's so important for us to make distinctions. Because I, as a person who was born with a body designed to create a certain size of gametes, that has completely shaped my life. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, before I was, I was born, my father's family said to my mother, we hope it's a boy. Mm -hmm. And um, to which my mother said, well, you know, I, I'll have whatever I have sort of yeah. thing. My mother was wonderful. But, but, you know, this idea that, you know, I, I grew up in a culture in which because I'm a woman, I cannot inherit property, all of those things. So it's shaped so much of my life. And I said that not at all thinking that I was right. causing offense at all. Right not intending to cause offense, but I also understand that it's possible to cause offense without meaning to, right? Yeah. It is. Um, but, but, you know, I, I didn't, and so afterwards I was so taken aback mm. by, you know, there were, you know, people wrote to people, I mean, it was just really horrible. I took mm. to my bed for two weeks. Mm. But what, and I, I don't like to talk about it because I don't like to cast myself as a victim. There's a kind of, there's almost 
it's almost impossible to talk about this with nuance without being accused either of, oh, you're making yourself the victim or, oh, you're so insensitive kind of thing. Well, that's part of the problem, right? That is I mean. part of the problem. <laughs> and that in some ways maybe is why I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I, I want to make a case for more nuance, right? right? And also a case for maybe more holistic thinking because I, I remember thinking, but why would anybody think that I meant harm? Because people said, well, you're creating a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, people said you're a murderer. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I sort of, my whole life has been about the celebration and the embrace of diversity and sort of, right. you know, I love the idea that we are different in the world. And, and I think my work speaks for myself, you know, for itself and, and the, the things, positions I've taken. And so it made me start to realize how, again, that idea of compassion, that idea of a kind of narrowing, a very, mm. very vicious narrowing mm. of um, just how one is supposed to be, right? right? right. And, and I also, you know, I got a lot of flowers from people during that period. It was almost as though somebody had died. No, seriously. Um, flowers sympathy, from- Sympathy, sympathy. Yes, yes. yes. I mean, just think about it. And, and, you know, and at the time, my parents were still alive, and my father did not understand. Mm. And, you know, my father was born in 1932. He was a professor of, of, of statistics. He reads very widely. Um, we often disagree. My father, um, you know, my father, I think, thought I was maybe too lefty. Mm -hmm. And so to him, it was just puzzling. Right. You know, he's like, I, but what, what, why? And I found that it was difficult for me to explain it to him. Right. And it also made me start to think about, you know, the assumptions that we make. I mean, I only in having that conversation with my father did I start to realize that even I had assumptions about, well, surely you should know this, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I've, um, I think I've blathered on for long yeah. enough. Um, we, all, we have very little time left, but I, um, I mean, in fact, probably no time, but I, st I do want to ask you about this. Um, because you know, I'm curious what the kind of joys and challenges of writing in this form were. Was it harder than embodying Melania Trump, or <laughs> or, or easier? It uh, was uh, easier. Easier. Okay. <laughs> no, I wrote it. It's actually based on 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 a day in the life of my daughter. Oh. We, um, and I wanted to. I just really wanted to celebrate the ordinary. I think there's just that idea of just an ordinary day and you're spending time with your family and there's just something very beautiful about it. Yeah. And my daughter, who is now going, who's going to be eight in two weeks, she, um, and I remember I'm, I'm carrying her one day and she pulls off my scarf because I always you know, tie a scarf to sleep as, as most black women I know have something in their heads when they sleep. Mm -hmm. And it's also what, what I want, I wanted to celebrate the ordinariness of black right. life. You right. know, I think there are a number of people who do not know that. Yeah. Um, and I thought, yes, I shall now spread the gospel of black women's um, <laughs> headgear for yeah. sleep. Yeah. But, but it was also really just, you know, my daughter pulled it off and I, and I, I had one of those, I just felt so moved. I mm. thought this moment will pass, she'll, she, she won't remember it, I probably will forget it. And I don't know, I just felt this sort of, you know, I'm, I'm giving to fits of strange melancholy and nostalgia. nostalgia yeah. So I had one of those fits and I started making notes and I, and I also wanted to celebrate my parents. Yeah. I was very close to my parents. Yeah, and, and the pseudonym is, is, yes, is your so parents. I, yeah. yeah, It's funny because I, when I read the book, I, I, I was having my own nostalgia of not having kids anymore who are the age yes. to read yes. this type of picture yeah. book and sort of missing <laughs> that. Okay, the last question I have to ask this because the fans out there you know, are going to want to know. It's the question that every author hates to get, but you know, it's been 10 years since Americana. <laughs> cool, that's a like, terrible <laughs> framing. <laughs> uh, uh, can, we, can we expect another novel at some point? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. No, I'm, I'm working on a novel. Yes. I'm trying, I'm trying to, um, well, you write books, so you know what that I know, feeling is. I know, is and like, I know so. what a terrible question that is to and ask. And especially when you frame it as, well, it's been 10 years. <laughs> and, <laughs> And so immediately I go into a panic. My God, it's been 10 years. I am working on a novel. Um, I'm hoping, yeah, I'm working on a novel. And I'm, yeah, hoping. That's all we need to know, is that it's coming. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.